Well, thank you very much, Francis, for the introduction and also for um, uh, your hospitality, uh, the generous invitation, and um, making this happen to begin with. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. It's a good time to be out of Canada. Canada is getting really, really cold at the moment. And I arrived here, and it's, it's lovely. And I was told it's always like that. Right? <laughs> um, Thanks for, for also mentioning my book. Um, I'm going to give a separate presentation um, on Friday. Uh, but today, it's not so much related to the, to the book or the critical perspective of borders. It more relates to a sabbatical that I spent um, last year, in the year 2015 and 2016, in Germany. And Germany, of course, um, was also um, in the focal point in the summer 2015. Um, it's called, well, people are now speaking about the great summer of, of, of migration, um, where almost a million refugees arrived in Germany. And at the time, we, we, the Germans thought um, it was actually more than a million. And, and the figures were, the, the ones that were quoted at the time, were exceeding one million. But now the latest figures um, indicate there was um, just under 900,000 people that arrived. And the migrants, uh, they came, they were refugees from Syria, from Iraq, uh, from, from Afghanistan, but also migrants, to make this distinction between refugees and migrants, migrants from Africa and other parts of the world. And strangely, now I have to figure out how to drive this here. Uh, strangely, um, their hero was uh, Merkel, um, the German chancellor. And I was. Uh, struggling to make sense of these events that happened in the summer 2015. Um, because a lot of the, the actions by the German government, and Merkel in particular, were sort of out of character. Um, and I was thinking, how, the, how could this happen? How could a conservative politician who was just a few weeks earlier um, represented or compared to Hitler in the Greek media in the context of the financial crisis? Um, how, how did this, con this conservative politician become a symbol of hope for the poor and for the oppressed refugees? Um, how could Germany, with a history of being an ethnic nation, open its borders to refugees? So all these were all kind of contradictory questions that I, that I wrestled with and I tried to make sense of. Um, to, the, to the bystander, to the casual bystander, Merkel's and Germany's policies lack, con lack consistency. Um, but I think to the ma more careful observer, these, these policies um, are also driven by m various material developments and interests, um, and also very competing different, uh, different competing um, political interests. So the problem that I've seen, and this is not only an, an, a problem um, when we interpret policies and politics, but also a, a problem that we in academia often confront, is that we are, um, we are forcing events and our own ways of thinking into, into linear frameworks, which implies that political arguments, our own arguments too, and political actions should be consistent. Um, and to address this problem, I wanted to um, take a different kind of framework um, to, to well play around with and, and maybe find, a, find an alternative or find an explanation making sense of these events. And this framework is dialectics. And I found this very, very productive as a, as a tool um, to, to make sense of the events that are not, that cannot be forced really in a linear, linear kind of framework. Um, and my interest in dialectics stems from um, another sabbatical, the previous sabbatical. We get sabbaticals every, every six years for one year, every three years for half a, half a year. So in 2007 and 2008, I also spent a sabbatical in Germany in the, in the city of, of Stuttgart. And of course, Stuttgart is also the birthplace of Hegel. And they have his birth house here. It's now the Hegel house. And they have a museum. The whole house is a museum. And they have the, 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 the lectures. Um, actually in the basement of the building. And they're public lectures, and they discuss Hegel every once, once a week. And, and I attended these, and I've, I found it very inspirational and, and very productive in, in the way that um, it in, could inform my own thinking. Um, and I, I also thought, thought that um, I was doing at the time, and 
the same thing that I've, that I, that I've been doing ever since. Um, immigration policy, I was looking at immigration policy debate in, in the Canadian context and also the German context. And I thought to myself that the Hegelian framework um, is actually can provide um, important insights into understanding politics, the politics of migration. And I've found, or I thought that Hegel was especially appealing um, because in a Canadian context, um, people rarely talk about, um, or maybe in, even in Anglo-American context, um, people rarely talk about dialectics or use the term dialectics when they talk about uh, migration policy and migration in general. So um, I was getting into, into dialectics and I had my whole family in Germany and um, my, my, my children were still little at the time. Let me just go back. No. Um, and eventually they wanted to know what, um, uh, what I'm working on and uh, the term dialectics came, comes up. And I often use this example to explain the, the general idea of, of of dialectics. So they asked me, um, they asked me once then, uh, what are you working on? And I talked about dialectics. So what is this, di this, this dialectical idea, they asked. Um, and I thought, okay, this, this is way too complicated. I'm gonna, just going to brush them off with, oh, dialectic is, is about everything and nothing. Um, and of course, they wanted to know more. They didn't capitulate. And I tried to get into a language that they didn't understand and it just produced um, be bewildered faces. And eventually, I thought, OK, let me talk about something they can understand. Um, if you um, punch your brother, then your brother gets mad and punches back. And they could, of course, relate to this kind of scenario. And um, Hegel would call this the first negation. And eventually, um, you both realize that if you, if you punch each other, it hurts both of you. Um, and then you decide this is not really what we should do or what we want to do. And we, you decide to do something different. And you might play a game with each other, um, other than boxing. <laughs> and Hegel would call this a second negation or a sublation, or the German term would be Aufhebung. And the idea is that you have contradicting positions, and they're being resolved into something, a, 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 a different kind of um, condition. Um, notice in this way, a dialectical relationship is also progressing. So the kids could find out when they play a game together that one of them is cheating. And then it starts from, from then, then these contradictions emerge again, and then um, uh, the, the it's a problematic situation that needs to be resolved again. Um, and so the, con the dialectic continues in this way. And, and probably knowing my kids, it probably would cheat, and it continues endlessly. And, and one contradiction is being followed by a resolution, which is followed by the next contradiction. Um, and a, a similar kind of dialectical pro progression, I noticed, occurs in immigration debate and policy. And let me try to explain this from um, based on some, some research that I've done in the context of this sabbatical uh, uh, about a decade ago. Um, in this figure here, I'm showing a dialectical relationship between the national imagination on the one hand and immigration on the other hand. Uh, the way in which a country imagines its national identity plays a key role in immigration policy. Um, through immigration policy, a nation, for example, selects who will be a member and who will be one of us, but also who will be excluded from, from membership um, and who should not belong to the nation. In the same way, uh, immigration shapes who we are as a nation or who we become as a nation. And Germany and Canada, I found, makes, make a very interesting comparison. Canada, um, I, would, I would call it a settler nation, and I think New Zealand and and Australia, I'm not an expert on these, these two countries, but I, I think that would, um, could be described in this way too, especially in the way that I will describe the settler nation in just a few minutes, in that um, national identity is very, very closely linked to um, immigration. Uh, in Canada, the Canadian nation cannot really be imagined without, without immigration. Without immigration, Canada, in a sense, wouldn't exist. So, Immigration is quite central, and migration, the narrative of migration, is quite central to the national imagination. Um, Germany, and Germany, that's not the case. Germany has, in fact, long denied 
um, being an immigration country and instead highlighted the ethnic nature of national identity. And if you look at the first, uh, at the very origins of um, the, Fran the, the German nation, it constructed itself in a dialectical way again in opposition to the French nation. And, and ethnicity was from the very beginning and language very important in, in the way that the German national identity was constructed. Um, in one research project, then, I compared immigration debates in Canada and Germany, and I, put a, I, I chose a, a period in which, in both countries, um, an, an immigration reform occurred, a legal reform of immigration policy. Um, and I noticed that in the Canadian debate, um, migrants were first depicted as dangerous. And that hints towards a dialectical practice of negation. So migrants, they're not really one of us. Um, and that negation exists. And that was a bit of a surprise, surprise to me, first because it was so Im important to the Canadian national imagination. And then all the polls um, suggest that, that Canada is really a, a place that welcomes migrants. But nevertheless, there is this construction of migrants not being like us. And that existed before 9-11. Um, for example, this is a quote from the Vancouver Sun from the year 2000, um, which reported um, the following in the context of the proposed legislation, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Our priority is the safety and national security interests of Canada, said the minister at the time of immigration. Um, in introducing the revamped Immigration Act in the Commons. We are not going to be a place that welcomes serious criminals, terrorists, war criminals, and those who committed crimes against humanities. Um, so terrorism is, and terrorists, uh, migrants can be potential, uh, potential terrorist threats. That's already mentioned here, well before September 11, 2001. Um, and also, Canada, a country that is firmly committed to immigration in the context of public opinion and, and pol its policies, um, the first depicts migrants and immigrants as non-belonging others. Um, and a similar kind of uh, uh, negation occurs in, the, in respect to refugees. Um, Okay, um, the refugees, they come from countries that, that represent the opposite of Canada. And this is why they want to come to Canada and to begin with. So they, they come from countries that lack opportunity. They come from countries that are unsafe, that are not peaceful, that are undemocratic, they lack freedom and so forth. But then um, the contradiction between the immigrant and the Canadian is being resolved. So the two opposite, um, the dialectical contradictions, is being resolved into a new kind of condition. And that is that immigrants, I should go back here, that immigrants and refugees become Canadians. So they, the others, um, will become one of us. Um, that has also been demonstrated in the, in the American context by, by Bonnie Honig, um, who, who was also um, developed or addressed this, this idea in, in a different way, that the, the foreigner is first a stranger, but then it becomes a person that replenishes the nation. In the German dialectic, or in the German debate that I looked at, this dialectic is truncated. The refugee and asylum seekers, well, they are constructed as the others, but they're not supposed to stay. Rather, they are being, they're supposed to, they, they should be repatriated. That's a narrative in the discourse in, in Germany. In Germany, the dialectic between the national Im imagination and immigration unfolded in a very different way. And I find this very interesting because the dialectical framework applies to it very nicely. Um, the immigration debate in Germany began in the late 1990s. There was a new government, a red-green government coalition. Um, and shortly after they assumed power, um, they declared that we are an immigration country too. And that became the dominant narrative in the, in the, in the public debate in the media. And based on this prom premise, the government announced um, a German green card and various initiatives um, and uh, established a commission that had the task to um, work out the details and the, well, the basic parameters actually first um, about the, f uh, the first immigration law that Germany would have. 
however, once the, the and, and the, the, the commission went to task and the, um, it, it came up with a proposal and it went through parliament, but then there was a legal challenge um, in the way or to the way that the law moved through, par through parliament and it was not passed or it was passed in parliament but it didn't become law and there was a multi-year delay, a constitutional challenge and in that time um, the material, material context changed. In particular the, the economy tanked, um, unemployment rose um, and a dialectical negation occurred in the way that immigration um, was was presented, or the idea that Germany is an immigration country was presented in Germany. Now Germany was presented um, as a non-immigration country. And this was uh, a commentary in, a, in a, I would call it a populist kind of right um, German newspaper build. Um, this quote here, the polls agree that citizens of almost all political orientations are of the opinion that we already have not too few but too many foreigners. So Germany was reconstructed, what it was before, as not an immigration country. Um, next, the immigration debate shifted to a, to a third position. Um, the integration of foreigners who have been in Germany for decades and generations, those are the, those are the children and, and the children of children of the former guest workers that came in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, um, that became, that became the, the topic. And then the, the new narrative was, n was not immigration, but more integration is the order of the day. That is actually a quote um, by the Süddeutsche Zeitung, um, a prominent um, newspaper in Germany. So Germany was declared an integration country. And this new position achieved several things. Um, the, first, the, the, the first point was that dangerous new immigration could be blocked. So we, we're not an immigration country, so we don't want to le let in new immigration into the country. Um, the second thing is that the, million of, of, or the, the millions of foreigners um, who have been present from previous um, guest worker programs in, in Germany, that could be acknowledged. And the third point was that these foreigners should be integrated into the national self. So the third um, position overcame and merged the former two contradicting positions that Germany um, is an immigration country and a non-immigration country at the same time. Um, and this was the status of the debate in Germany about a decade ago. So armed with these Hegelian tools, or these, these tools of Hegelian dialectics, I want to try to uh, interpret the, uh, Germany's reaction to the, uh, to the great summer of migration. And I do this very cautiously because we know that Hegel's famous Owl of Minerva takes flight at dusk after the events of the day already happened. So it's very important that it's very difficult to predict through using this framework. It's more, it's, it's easier to reflect, <laughs> right? Um, in the same way, um, so the, the events in the same way as, as Hegel's uh, Owl of Minerva takes flight at dusk, in the same way um, the events in Germany are still ongoing and unfolding in ways that are, that are not very easy to predict. And that's part of this, this unfortunately, this, this dialectical framework as well. So let me pick up from where we left um, in this immigration debate in Germany. Um, since roughly 2010, an increasing number of refugees and migrants uh, have come to Europe from various different places, from Syria and the Middle East, from Africa, in particular Somalia, um, the Sudan and Eritrea, but also Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the Balkan states. While Europe tried to secure its borders, um, migrants took ever greater risks to reach Europe, and the effect was more and more um, was that, that more and more people tragically died, especially in the, in the Mediterranean. At that time, um, Germany also received an, an increasing number of migrants, refugees, and asy asylum seekers, especially from the Balkan states and the, and the, um, the conflict er areas in, in Africa and the Middle East. Um, and these kind of, this, this rising um, movement of people, this migrant movement, or movements, I should say, uh, defined the, in the way the material context in which subsequent political events then unfolded. And I think a key event in, in my interpretation was um, an anti-migrant movement that began um, 
it's called PEGIDA. PEGIDA stands for um, Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamist Cessation um, of the Occident. And they had rallies, especially in eastern Germany, in, in, in particular those places that um, ironically don't have many migrants to begin with. Um, but they became very prominent, very strong. They received media attention. The rallies began here in October 2014 and quickly gained supporters. And around the same time, there was an increase in arson attacks on refugee shelters throughout Germany. Um, but the, these rallies, these Pegida rallies, met a dialectical negation in the form of counter de demonstrations by citizens who, who opposed Pegida. And among these um, were uh, civic leaders who joined a counter movement, for example, in, in the night of January 5th. Um, 2015, the, the, the Bishop of Cologne switched off the, the lights of the Cologne Cathedral to make the point um, that we are protesting against this, this Pegida movement. Leading politicians strongly spoke out um, against P Pegida. And here we see um, uh, also a re reaction to these, uh, I think, was in soccer stadiums um, where the fans declared, welcome refugees. We're, we're happy that you're here and we're, we're ready for, to, to accommodate you. And Merkel also rejected the protests with harsh words. In late August, she commented on anti-migrant protests in Saxony in this way here. There are three quotes, and she repeated that over and over. Um, one example here, it is shameful how citizens, even families with children, support these protests. And it's revolting how right-wing extremists and neo-Nazis try to spread messages of hate. Um, on the third example, um, there is no tolerance for people who question the human dignity of others. And of course, she's, here she's making um, reference to the first paragraph of the German constitution, which protects human dignity. And I think Merkel's reaction here can be interpreted in light of her imagination of Germany as a nation. So here we come back to this, to this idea of the national imagination. Pegida and the burning refugee shelters do not belong in her image of Germany. And how better to affirm this positive national imagination, or better to affirm a positive national imagination than through a dialectical negation. And this negation entailed not, o not only speaking out against um, anti-migrant protests, but also welcoming and protecting refugees. Um, and these reactions, or these verbal reactions here, these quotes, they coincided with the new policy directive. So with, a, in a way, a material kind of manifestation. Uh, in that the German um, Federal Office for Migrants and Refugees canceled the Dublin Agreement um, for, refugee, for, for refugees from Syria. That means that Syrian refugees were not sent back to the country through which they entered Europe, but once they arrived in, in Germany, they could actually stay in Germany. Under Dublin, they would be uh, sent back to the first country on Euro within U the EU where they, where they landed. And the effect was that refugee flows and movements um, dramatically changed. And of course, they increased. In early September 2015, this is where, it, where the great summer of migration began, large numbers of migrants and refugees arrived in Germany here. This image um, shows um, the train station of Munich, where approximately 20,000 refugees arrived um, just in one weekend alone. Um, most of them came through Germany uh, to Germany uh, over the Austrian-Bavarian border. Um, and Bavaria plays uh, an important, uh, it's, it's a state within Germany or a region um, within Germany, and it played an important role in an unfolding dialectic as well. Um, and there was large support among the German population. People volunteered their time to assist um, the refugees. They came to the train stations, helped out whenever they, 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 they could. There were, there were children donating their toys and their, their, their teddy bears to the arriving refugee children. And Merkel spread optimism when she repeatedly said, we can handle this. Uh, the German term would be, it's quite famous now, um, the wir schaffen das, because she repeated that over and over again. Um, however, the term crisis also became increasingly linked to the arrival 
of migrants. And cri crisis, of course, suggests that something is out of control, that we are unable to manage the situation. And the president of Bavaria then demanded to close the border to Austria as a measure of self-defense. Um, so you see the dialectical pendulum is beginning to swing back um, in, 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 in the other direction. And this, this swinging of the dialectical pendulum, pendulum or the situation had again political consequences. Um, and these were the countermeasures. On September 13, uh, 2015, two decades after the Schengen Agreement est established freedom of mobility within Europe, um, Germany re-established controls at the border with Austria. Um, the, next, um, the next step was in October, Parliament passed a new asylum law which reduces financial support payments to refugees to create a disincentive for refugees to arrive to, to, to even come to Germany or want to come to Germany. Um, it enabled faster deportations of failed refugee claimants and declared the West Balkan states as safe origin countries so that um, refugees claims um, from these countries would be rendered in, invalid. By October, the media and the uh, city mayors um, raised serious questions if we can handle the situation. Um, and here, there's, there's again an inter interesting contradiction between Merkel's optimism, and she continues to, to the present day, she says, um, we can handle this, um, and the pessimism of regional and municipal um, lawmakers and policymakers who say, well, we are really having problems handling this situation. Um, and to address this contradiction, I think the problem was, was redefined. So a, a third kind of um, solution was found, not really by doing something about the, the problem itself, but redefining the problem. And the solution can be summarized, or I would summarize it in, in, in the way that we can handle that, but in an orderly fashion. Um, recall that crisis is, is really uh, suggesting that it's out of control, but um, we are creating order back into, into the system. And several initiatives were, implement, uh, pr were implement, implemented to create this kind of order. First, the Dublin Agreement or procedure was reinstated um, for Syrians, which meant that Syrians can be returned to the country um, uh, where they entered uh, the EU. Then um, transit zones were created where refugees um, will be registered. That's within, within Germany and actually at, at Germany's borders where um, refugees will be registered and their claims can be checked and assessed. And it's again um, um, introducing orderly procedures. Um, restrictions to family re reunification um, were implemented, in, which include uh, Syrian refugees. So uh, previously, Syrian refugees could bring their families. Now, they, now it's not that easy anymore. Um, efforts were also undertaken to fight the causes of the migration flows, including the establishment of a, of a multi-billion um, euro trust fund for Africa. And this, this new position, and then incorporates the previous two positions. Namely, we can handle this and we need order. So we handle this in an orderly fashion. Um, and then material on the ground circumstances changed again. Um, the Paris attacks of November 13. Um, and immediately within, within a very short period of time, a prominent Bavarian politician tweeted, Paris attacks change everything. I tweeted it in German, but that's a, that was the translation. Um, but there was also an immediate um, response from the media, from the co coalition partner, the, the, the Social Democrats, from civic leaders and from many others who, who said that the, that the two refugee issues and, and terrorism should not be conflated, conflated and that the refugees are actually fleeing from terrorism as well. But nevertheless, the idea that Paris changes everything, it stuck. And it changed again um, policies and the narrative. Um, in the wake of, of Paris, the Paris attacks, restrictions continued and Germany worked hard to implement these restrictions. And uh, many of these restrictions were implemented at the, at the EU level. Um, but Germany, of course, participated and drove a lot of these initiatives. <coughs> One of them was the closing of the Balkan route. 
um, in spring 2016. So um, the, the, which meant that the, the, the states along the Balkan route where most um, refugees entered from Turkey um, through the Balkans, um, Germany, um, they closed their borders and, their, and, and made transit not possible anymore. Then the EU reached a deal with Turkey in March 2016. And under this deal, Turkey takes, takes back irregular migrants that are sent from countries like Germany. And, and, and EU then agrees to take a so-called legitimate refugee in, in return. Um, a third initiative was increased EU-Africa cooperation, where the EU offers to spend billions of dollars to prevent refugees from leaving and coming to, Can to, to, to Europe in, in the first place. And the consequence was the reduction of the number of arrivals. In January 2016, there was still a, a, an, an, a, or the numbers of arrivals were still around 2,000 a day. And that has dropped in, in June 2016 to an average of 100 a, a day. Um, but nevertheless, um, the, the right-wing nationalist uh, movement, and now it's, uh, it has been, there was a new party established, the Al Alternative for Germany, or AFD, um, continues to enjoy growing support. And here's a poster. Um, from one, one of the um, regional uh, elections, and it says, stop uh, the asylum chaos, and they're using this chaos language again, a situation that's out of control, and secure our borders. Again, we need to bring order into, in, into this matter. In the regional elections, uh, the, this new party uh, was quite successful in Mecklenburg, uh, Western Pomerania, um, they achieved almost 25, um, almost 21 percent, and uh, Berlin, a very cosmopolitan city, 14.2 um, um, percent, so almost 15 percent. Um, and this is where we are at the moment, and I think and the, the dialectic um, continues to unfold. But let me wrap up with a few final observations. Um, I still see currently an unresolved contradiction between two competing national imaginations. And it's not necessarily, um, so it's, I think the national imagination is, is quite, quite central in the way that, that uh, policies, um, or the, uh, the, that policies are designed and, and migration discourses evolve in, 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 in Germany. On the one hand, there is a cosmopolitan Germany that welcomes refugees and embraces diversity. On the other hand, there's an ethnic Germany that feels quite threatened and rejects Islam. And it's yet uncertain how this contradiction will resolve, but I'm, I'm pretty sure um, using this, this dialectical framework um, that there will be a, a new way either of re-articulating, um, maybe it has an impact on, on the, the Germany, the German population, the German um, Germany itself um, reframing its national identity, I don't know, but I think um, it's inevitable that, that uh, this, this, this contradiction is somehow addressed and resolved, um, at least temporarily. Um, and factors might be the, the right-wing um, nationalism that we observe not only in Germany, but even more so in, in other parts of Europe and, and, and in the US as well. Um, and I think the, the election of Donald Trump actually might play a, a very important role in that it uh, legitimate racist rhetoric to a degree, to a large degree. And of course, um, this is now, well, again, it's, it's very difficult to, to tell with the, what's going to happen with, for example, the, vote, uh, the recent vote in, in Austria, where there's again sort of, it, it stopped um, this, this perpetuation of, of right-wing nationalism. Um, the second observation that I wanted to make is that um, the dialectical framework, to me at least, works really well of making sense of these contradictions and the progression of a debate and polit political kind of measures. Um, and, and, well, the politics in Germany and elsewhere. Um, and I think uh, our national imag imagination, and this is, this is my third and final point, that our national imagination is quite central in this, in the way that we need to address and make sense of immigration policy and debate. Um, the, our national imagination 
um, who we think we are as a, as a national community, which is also very problematic, I think, but I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go there on Friday. <laughs> um, our national imagination, who we think who, uh, who, who we think we are as a national community, fundamentally shapes migration and refugee politics and debate. And in turn, the material kind of migration that comes to a country shapes the nation and, and who the nation is and becomes. And I think the current events in this context are very interesting for me as an immigration scholar um, because I think there's really some fundamental um, shifts going on in the national uh, imagination in Germany, but also in, in other countries. And I'll end here, and I look forward to your questions. And um, I would be interested in learning over the next few days how this immigration national imagination dialectic has unfolded in, in, in a New Zealand context. Um, but I also imagine that you have other kinds of questions. Thank <laughs> you.